Well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here, even if the temperature is about uh, uh, 20 degrees centigrade uh, lower than in London. Um, and many thanks to Patrick and to the other people in the team at the Haven Center. It's quite a job to organize um, a trip like this, and they've, they've done very well on their side of it. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to begin with the fact of um, this talk, this buzz um, around the world about an emerging new world economic order, um, especially since 2008. And um, you find evidence of this talk all over the place. This is a statement by Robert Zellick, presi then president of the World Bank. We are now in a new, fast evolving, multipolar, that's a key word, multipolar world economy. And you will be familiar with all these phrases, the rise of the rest, the rise of the east, the rise of the south. The Financial Times just yesterday carried a long article on Africa rising, um, Asia catching up with the west, the great reconvergence, China, the new superpower, and so on and so on. A recent book on this theme by Kishore Mabumbani, the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, was titled The Great Convergence, Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World. Um, and the other side of this is renewed talk of US decline. And this same Kishore Mabubani was quoted by uh, Tom Friedman in the um, International New York Times, as it's now called, just a few days ago. Um, all over Asia, people are asking, can America manage itself? And what are the implications for us in Asia if America cannot manage itself? Um, and then there's this wonderful um, comment from the official Chinese news agent uh, after the US government shutdown. It is a good time after the shutdown for the befuddled world to start considering building a de-Americanized world. I'd never heard this word de-Americanized uh, before, but um, it may be one that we're going to be more familiar with in the future. And um, you see uh, the negative valence attached to uh, all this talk on the, in some quarters in this uh, WikiLeaks um, email uh, released uh, from the senior US official for, G, for the G20 process, that is the US Sherpa, who said in 2010, uh, yes, um, it is remarkable how closely coordinated the basic group of countries are, that's these ones, um, how uh, closely coordinated they've become in international fora. I love this bit, taking turns to impede the US and European Union initiatives, impede us in our good work for the world, um, and playing the US and the <coughs> EU off against each other. Um, and then, also, I was uh, quite startled to learn in a recent um, Ipsa Mori um, poll that a majority of Americans, a small majority, think that China will be the dominant economy by 2050. And as a matter of fact, th this is from memory, and I, it may have been by 2033, that is to say 20 years in the future, that a majority think China will be the dominant um, economy in the world. And uh, also a majority of Americans now think that globalization is a bad thing rather than a good thing. So this, these are indicators of a sort of sense of fear, of anxiety about the future. Um, if we ask what are, the, what are the indicators of this idea of the rising uh, weight, the rising weight of the South, um, well, one of the main ones, relative growth rates, and something important has happened, there's no question. You can uh, infer that uh, having set out the conventional wisdom, this talk, I'm going to question the accuracy of this talk, but there is no doubt that over the 2000s, both the middle and the low income countries have grown at some four to six percentage points faster than the high income countries, six high income countries. And this is the first time in history that such um, um, a phenomenon has happened. So this is quite significant. Um, and another indicator in the same direction, if you take the te top 10 biggest economies in terms of 
real GDP. That's not in terms of purchasing power parity, but in terms of real GDP at exchange, market exchange rates. In 1990, the top 10 included the G7 plus Spain plus Russia at number 7, Brazil number 10. That was it. Um, then in 2010, 20 years later, the G7 was still there. That's important to note. The G7 was still in the top 10. And then joined by China at number 2, Brazil number 7, and India at number 10. And um, so this is um, much the same thing. This is an, uh, uh, these charts show the share of world GDP um, for China and India from 1990 through to 2000, sorry, 1980, 1980 through to 2010. And if you just look, for example, at, um, uh, at market, uh, GDP at market exchange rates, I hope I don't need to explain to, to an audience of sociologists why, for some purposes, market exchange rates are more relevant than purchasing power parity exchange rates. Um, you can see how China has gone from 1980, 2% of world GDP, to something um, of the order of over 9% of world GDP. India um, has gone from 2% to, well, uh, sorry, at, at, um, yeah, at market exchange rates, India has not actually gone up very much at all. But it has gone up significantly in terms of purchasing power parity. And these kind of things, these trends, um, are important in support of the argument that we are entering, we have entered um, a new uh, international economic order. So there's been a kind of a gestalt shift um, in how the South and how developing countries um, are seen, which I think is analogous to this dramatic gestalt shift that's going on right now in how the Arctic is seen. The Arctic used to be seen as a kind of distant periphery. It's now being seen as a frontier, and that does make a very big difference. So in the same kind of way, the South, or parts of the South, are now seen as a frontier rather than a periphery, a frontier meaning um, full of new opportunities and also new threats. But the question is, that's the shift. The question is, what's the reality? Um, and I'm going to start with this question of multipolarity. Multipolarity, obviously, in the economic and financial sense, not in the bombs and rockets sense. Um, and what my basic message is that this idea that the world has become a multipolar world economy is a sizable exaggeration. First of all, the U.S. remains by far the dominant state, the dominant economy, 4.5% of the world's population is producing 22% of world GDP. World WGP is world GDP. 22% um, again measured not in parity, purchasing power parity terms but in market exchange rate terms. Um, the US has very strong, continues to have very strong positional advantages such as finance. The US completely dominates um, world financial markets with Britain as a kind of um, offshore hub to the US. Um, in terms of the West as a whole, the West, that is to say, uh, the North America plus uh, Western Europe, uh, accounts for more than 50% of world GDP, uh, more than 65% of foreign direct investment, 93% of world foreign exchange reserves are in um, Western currencies. Um, so, as I suggested before, one measure of um, economic weight is the sh a country's share of world GDP. And um, I put it to you that you, you would be surprised to see the charts that I'm about to show. The ch charts I'm about to show show the um, share of world GDP in uh, accruing from uh, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, South Africa from 1980 to 2010. So it's basically the same information as I showed a minute ago for China and India. And this is what the charts show. This is Indonesia, 1980 through 2010, flat in terms of the share. Brazil, um, even more surprising, I think, given the, the talk about Brazil, um, flat. Russia, 
flat, South Africa, tiny and flat. So this particular measure of economic weight is, 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 is difficult to reconcile with this idea of a whole group of emerging market economies forging up the world economic um, hierarchy. Um, and another measure of economic weight is GDP per head relative to the rich OECD. If you take the middle income countries, and the countries classed as middle income in 1980, then the ratio of their um, average income to that of the OECD actually fell from 1980 through to the, two, the early 2000s. Um, and then after the early 2000s, in line with the bigger trend in terms of growth rates that I showed earlier, from the early 2000s onwards, that ratio has increased. The share of income, the, the ratio of the middle income countries um, in, um, to that of the OECD did increase from the early 2000s till today. But this picture of the emerging uh, world economy with these developing countries fast catching up, converging on the north, is true if you, um, if you begin in the early 2000s. If you begin further back, then as I said, you have, a, a, you have an inverted U curve, and the U at the end does not go up as high as it was in 1980. And then the third point, a, a point that's very uh, often neglected, in fact generally neglected, um, and that is that this, all this talk about the rise of China conceals the point that the rise of China is actually hurting the rise of many other developing countries, in particular because of the way China is able to outcompete developing countries both at the low end, low value added end, and at the higher value added end. So you can't just take the rise of China as the kind of precursor of the rise of a whole lot of others coming along behind China. The rise of China is actually hurting uh, especially the industrialization, the development of manufacturing in many other middle-income countries, putting them into what has been called a middle-income trap. So that's what I want to say about multipolarity. My point is that this idea of the world as a new multipolar economy is substantially exaggerated because most of it is due to one country only, and that of course is the biggest, the, sec the biggest country in terms of population, but certainly not the biggest in terms of GDP, <laughs> namely China. Um, but you can't talk of a general shift in the world on account of one country. Now I want to talk about other variables, power ideology and effectiveness of international and intergovernmental organizations. And so there are three questions. How much of a shift has there been in the distribution of power in favor of DCs, DCs developing countries, um, as seen in, in international organizations, intergovernmental organizations? Um, and thinking in of power in terms of presence at top decision-making fora, um, autonomy, and also, thirdly, influence. Um, then the third question, how much of a shift in dominant ideology has there been, in particular, to what extent is neoliberalism in retreat? Neoliberalism meaning essentially the idea that the market is the best means, the best mechanism for achieving human ambitions and should always be preferred, except in exceptional circumstances, to any kind of allocation of resources through um, authoritative mechanisms such as the state. Um, to what extent has neoliberalism been in retreat in these past one to two decades? And thirdly, how much of a shift in effectiveness of international organizations has there been? So, if you have a hypothesis that big economies are also more powerful, are also powerful economies, then you can think of the question in this kind of way. Uh, this is economic weight, this is, say, political power, this might be ideology, you could put effectiveness of international organizations on the same axis. And so if you have, say, an increase in economic weight of, say, a group of countries, developing countries, what is the effect in terms of their political power? If 
that it's one to one, then obviously you would expect movement on the 45 degree line. Um, if it's less than one to one, you would expect movement somewhere out here. But the question is where? Um, to, uh, is the line more like this or is the line more like that? That's at least a, 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 a way of thinking about the issue conceptually, but I have to tell you right away that I don't have anything like measurements with which to pin this down. What we can be quite clear about, and uh, this is the one firm conclusion, is that um, uh, international organizations have become more inclusive, especially since 2008. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on the G20, because the G20 is often held up as an example of how we are in a new <coughs> emerging international economic order, and this is the G20 is the governance part of this uh, new order. So just let me remind you, for those of you who don't know and love the G20, um, it began in 1999 when the G7F, F stands for finance ministers, the G7F, comprising of these countries, decided uh, as they were debating what to do about the East, what was called the East Asian crisis. It's known, in, in, by the way, in East Asia as the IMF crisis, not the East Asian crisis. But the, uh, at that time, 1999, this crisis had spread out of East Asia into Latin America, into Russia, and the West was very worried that the crisis might ricochet back into the West. So um, the G7 finance ministers met, and they recognized that um, for them to sit at the table and try and figure out what to do about the East Asian crisis without having East Asians and maybe others at the table with them was a bit silly. It would be like the captain of a ship who stands at the wheel, moving the wheel backwards and forwards, knowing that the wheel is not connected to the rudder so that nothing's actually happening. The G7 finance ministers recognized they would be in that same position if they didn't bring into their discussions representatives of the countries that were in crisis. And so, um, to cut a long story short, and it is an interesting story, um, they decided to expand themselves to the G20F finance ministers. And the G20 comprised the G7 plus Australia plus the EU, which is somewhat anomalous, and then 11 developing countries, namely these ones. These were countries that described themselves, all of them, as systemically important, or were described by the G7, that's to be more accurate, as systemically important countries, the systemically important countries. And then there came the 2008 crash, and the G20 finance ministers um, were upgraded to the summit level, making two levels, namely the finance ministers level, and also the L, the leaders level, and the G20L comprised the same countries, together with Spain, which managed to get itself um, uh, uh, an invitation as a permanent guest. Um, and this group of 20 countries now comprises 85% of world GDP, 80% um, uh, of world trade, two-thirds of world population, <coughs> and it declared itself as the successor of the G8 as the main uh, economic council of the world and indeed as equivalent to the UN Security Council for economic and financial and, and development issues. Um, and it declared itself as a great achievement. Uh, this is uh, one expression of it. Sarkozy never lost an opportunity to exaggerate anything that he was, uh, any achievement he was associated with, so he called it the G20 prefigures the planetary governance of the 21st century. Um, as you will see by the time I get to the end, if this is true, then we're in for a bad time. Um, the G20L has met nine times starting in November 2008. Um, at the first two summits, remember November 2008 in uh, Washington, then the London one in, I think, April 2009, they focused fairly narrowly on three things, coordinating macroeconomic stimulus in response to the crash, uh, secondly, financial sector reform, and thirdly, and this is quite significant as in the story to come, reform of the IFIs, international financial institutions, meaning mainly the IMF and the World Bank. Um, 
And then, after the first two summits, they began to expand themselves from crisis committee to steering committee for the world. Um, and so they expanded the agenda to include payments and balances, to include uh, development, agriculture, environment, the Eurozone crisis, and several other big topics as well. What are the problems? <clears throat> well, first of all, and it's quite obvious, though nobody wants to talk about this, um, the G20 lacks what you could call input legitimacy, or, to, or it lacks representational legitimacy, because the members were simply chosen by the G7, or to be more exact, by Timothy Geithner at the US uh, Treasury, who was then uh, Deputy Treasury Secretary to Larry Summers. Remember, this is 1999. And Timothy Geithner's count German counterpart, Kaio Kochweser, and they simply went down, they had a series of transatlantic telephone calls, they simply went down the list of countries saying, yes, this one should be in, no, 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 these ones should be out. And, and then they put their list together and uh, got the rest of the G7 to confirm that this was a good set of countries. And basically that's how the invitations went out. Um, the second point to note is that the G20 does not replace the G7 or the G8. And in fact, this group, or group, actually two groups, one, the G8 includes Russia, the G7 does not, still basically calls the shots in the G20, because this group, especially the G7, is very used to coordinating an agenda. So they meet before the G20, they agree on what they want to get out of the G20, and then in the G20 meetings, they are the central power block. Um, and thirdly, the G20 has no representational structure, which means that 182 UN uh, states are permanently excluded, permanently excluded. And so you get, for example, the Norwegian foreign minister, Norway, of course, is permanently excluded. All the Baltics are permanently excluded. The G20 is one of the biggest setbacks to international relations since the Second World War. Since the Second World War, not since the end of communism, but since the Second World War, that's a long time to have a big setback. Um, and you can contrast this statement with what Sarkozy said. The second big problem with the G20 is that it undercuts the existing and legitimated, underlying legitimated governance bodies. Um, for example, at the UN, uh, in terms of the UN, the London summit of the G20 in April 2009, the G20 declared that the role, and this is important, the role of the UN was simply to monitor the impact of the crisis on the poorest and most vulnerable. That is, the role of the UN was not to engage in a debate about the causes of the crisis, um, about the weaknesses, the, uh, the flaws in the international monetary system, for example. No, that was for the IMF. Uh, and for other organizations that the West controls. The, the role of the UN was simply to monitor the effects of the crisis out there in the periphery. I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Um, another example, in terms of the World Bank and the IMF executive boards, whatever you think about these boards, at least they have a legitimated structure of representation. All the members of the World Bank and the IMF are involved in a representational structure. And yet here you have um, the G20 issuing instructions as to what the executive boards of these two organizations should and should not do. And I've talked to executive directors from non-G20 countries, um, and they complain that when they speak at meetings of the board, the board is a sort of, uh, it has, in the case of the World Bank, 25, that must be about the size of this table. So you can imagine a board meeting at the World Bank, then the IMF has 24. And what these non-executive uh, directors from non-G20 countries say is that when they speak, the executive directors from the G20 countries do this. They shut their ears or they do their emails or they do not pay attention, basically, because they know what they have agreed to do in G20 forums, and they don't need to listen to what the executive directors from non-G20 countries um, have to say. 
Um, so that's the idea of the G20. This point, I think, is totally unrecognized in any of the literature that I've seen about the G20, where even from critics, let alone from the many champions of the G20, of which there are, especially in Canada. Um, and then the third problem is that the G20 lacks output legitimacy, that is to say, it lacks effectiveness. Now, let me qualify that, because certainly um, at the first two summits, when the crisis was really raw, um, there's no question that it was, it was effective in coordinating macroeconomic stimulus. But as a recent essay on the G20 in this journal says, this journal is called Global Policy. Um, I strongly recommend it. It's a re relatively recent journal uh, coming out from, well, from England, but specifically from LSE, amongst other places. It's got really good stuff in it and very policy relevant. Um, so the recent paper about the G20 in global policy uh, came to this conclusion. The G20 has become visibly immobilized in the last four summits. And one of the main reasons is to do with what I showed before. The G20 has taken on more and more issues in its role as the steering committee, but as it takes on more and more issues, so the cleavages within its membership become sharper um, and new cleavages are introduced as new issues come onto the um, agenda. In particular, the G20 has been uh, totally ineffective in coordinating um, uh, responses to one of the fundamental problems facing the world, which is the problem of macroeconomic uh, imbalances, that is to say payments imbalances. Some countries running large surpluses, others running large deficits. And um, the countries around the G20 table are just at loggerheads in dealing with an issue like that. Think of the US and China, for example. Um, so that's the G20. Let me talk a bit about the WTO. The WTO has been in a kind of slow burn legitimacy crisis since the late 1990s. And in particular because more and more members, especially from developing countries, have, been, have criticized the WTO for its excessive focus on expanding neoliberal principles. Of course, that's not the language which is used. They don't talk about neoliberal principles, but that's the gist of it. Um, uh, the point being that developing countries complain that the um, policies of the WTO, coming out of the WTO, steered by the West, focus on, give priority to protecting the growth of cross-border activity by private entities and shrinking the scope of state um, regulation and hence intruding too deeply into domestic regulation. So, for example, giving um, priority to um, tobacco companies that wish to um, have free trade, free entry of their tobacco products into, let's say, Thailand, when the Thai government is trying to restrain uh, tobacco consumption in the interests of public health, but WTO um, policies and decisions have um, given priority to the tobacco companies because that is in the spirit of free trade, that is to say, in the spirit of expanding neoliberal principles. And similarly, fishing companies have uh, won victories in the WTO um, over efforts of governments to restrict fishing within their waters. And uh, uh, the same thing applies to various uh, measures of consumer protection. Um, so in response to these criticisms coming especially from developing countries, um, there has been a response, namely the appellate body, the body that uh, takes disputes, trade disputes, um, has become, over the past decade or half decade, has become more cautious about impose, uh, imposing a vision of optimal regulation on domestic policy. And it's been giving more emphasis to the question of the transparency and adequacy of states' procedures, their procedures for judging um, public health, for judging uh, consumer protection, for judging environmental protection, um, uh, and to the point where if it judges 
that a country's environmental assessment procedures are adequate. It gives more weight to state regulation versus um, <coughs> the interests of companies that want to override, foreign companies especially, that want to override um, countries' environmental protection uh, restrictions. Um, so what has been happening then through this growing caution about imposing a vision of optimal regulation is that um, states, especially developing countries, have gained more autonomy for domestic regulation. But that's a long way from saying that this um, process is leading to the emergence of new non-neoliberal non non -neoliberal principles governing international trade. It's not, uh, the point about expanding state autonomy is not the same as creating a body of non-neoliberal principles for international trade. That second point has not been uh, happening. Um, and then something else is happening in the WTO, which is that um, as developing countries have pushed back against the agenda of the Doha Round, the agenda of the Doha Round did intrude very deeply into domestic regulation, especially of developing countries. And so developing countries have been pushing back. The result is stalemate. And as the stalemate has gone on and on and on, uh, what has happened is that Western states are simply bypassing the WTO and they're making bilateral or regional trade agreements. And in these regional or bilateral tr trade agreements, neoliberal principles of free trade, free investment, are much stronger than they are in, um, say, the Uruguay Round Agreements of the WTO. Um, uh, and that's because Western states have a much stronger arm in negotiating these regional and bilateral trade and investment deals than they do in the WTO. Um, and it's interesting that as the Western states are bypassing the WTO just at this time, for the first time ever, somebody from a, a major developing country, namely Brazil, has been appointed head of the WTO. And it will be very interesting to see whether he succeeds in sort of resurrecting the WTO. Um, so that's the WTO. I've talked about the G20, the, uh, the WTO. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the, what's happening in the IMF. In the IMF, the West very much continues to control it. It's always appointed the managing director, appointed the last one as well. Um, Western Europe is heavily overrepresented in the executive board. Western Europe has eight seats out of 24, and when Spain is the head of one of the other constituencies, then, which includes Venezuela and Mexico, then Western Europe has nine seats out of 24. This is something that makes the Americans very, very mad. And the Americans have been pushing um, the European states to reduce their seats to one or maybe two, one from the European Union, uh, one, one from the, what is it, the Council, and one from the Commission, or something like that. But somehow or other, the Americans have been very keen to get the Western European representation down. Um, the, the third point, and this is often not appreciated, the U.S. has always appointed the number two person in the IMF, um, and the U.S. has a veto on supermajority decisions. Uh, the U.S. Congress, Congress people tend to regard both the fund and the bank as instruments of U.S. foreign policy, and to the extent that the fund and the bank don't follow U.S. foreign policy, then Congress tends to think that it must cut its funding for both in order to teach both a lesson, that they must remain compliant with U.S. wishes. There are statements from Congress people which are almost as explicit as I've just said. Let me say a bit more about this supermajority issue. Um, a supermajority is required to make any changes in the uh, constitution of the IMF, also the World Bank, or the constitution is called the Articles of Agreement, the supermajority is currently set at 85%. And so the US share is always at the point where the uh, US can wield a supermajority and is the only country able to 
will the supermajority on its own. So the US currently has more than 15% of the votes. The Western Europeans want to lower the supermajority to, for example, 75%. And the reason is because if, they all co if the Western Europeans cooperate, then they can exercise a supermajority um, with a seven, with, when it's set at 75%. They could exercise a veto if the supermajority is set at 75%. Interestingly enough, the BRICS, and I'm going to come back to the BRICS in a minute, they join with the US in opposing the lowering because they say the only people to benefit from the lowering would be the Western Europeans, and also because um, they know that the BRICS combined share is more than 15%. So if they cooperate, they can exercise a veto. And that raises the question, what do they want to exercise a veto about? And um, I was talking to some executive directors from the BRICS countries just uh, very recently, and one of the things that they particularly emphasized, they want to keep the, vote, the veto for, is to stop uh, revision of Article 6. This is the key article um, of, in the article, the key article in the Articles of Agreement of the Fund, which gives member states the right to manage, that is code for restrict, capital flows across their borders. The point here, of course, as you'll know, is that the US and the Europeans have for long wanted to make free, a commitment to free capital mobility, free capital movements across the border, a condition of membership of the fund. Um, and the BRICS want to make sure that they can veto any move by the US and the Europeans to modify this so as to remove this right to manage. Um, and so this is an example of um, a BRICS pushback against neoliberal principles. I'm going to um, shortcut this discussion of the World Bank, except to make uh, a couple of points. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the G20 instructed the governing bodies of both the bank and the fund to um, undertake voice reforms, and the G20 even said how much of a shift in the share of votes should go from the advanced countries to the developing countries. And in the case of the bank, the G20 said, you, the World Bank, must shift at least three percentage points um, from the part one, that is the rich countries, to the part two, that is the developing countries. And so the World Bank, the executive board and the staff undertook agonizing negotiations going on from 2008 through to 2010, uh, negotiations described by one participant as 24-7. On and on and on went the negotiations with people negotiating at the second decimal point. So the negotiations were, for example, whether this state should get 2.81% or 2.82% of the votes. This was a matter of life and death for these um, executive <coughs> directors. And so then the headline went out. Um, that there was actually a more than three percentage point shift in the share of votes from the part one to the part two countries. Well, in um, early this year, in the journal World Development, I and my Danish collaborator wrote a detailed study of the World Bank voice reform, and we concluded that, that in reality, uh, far from the shift being more than three percent, the shift was actually 0.46%. In other words, practically nothing. And it was a stroke of genius as to how the bank managed to generate the headline and apparently comply with the G20 and actually do almost nothing. The second point to make about the World Bank is that now 40% of the bank's operational budget, 40%, 40%, an astonishingly high figure, comes from trust funds. And trust funds... Um, are funds that a country, say Japan or the US or New Zealand or Norway, give to the bank, whereby a bank project officer can use the funds uh, from a particular country's trust fund for a particular project uh, by employing nationals from the country and from doing things in the project that the country from which the money comes wants to be done. And so I call this 
a process of bilateralization of the World Bank, whereby Norway or New Zealand or Japan or whoever it is gets sort of legitimacy, multilateral legitimacy for their projects. They get employment of their nationals um, uh, in, in a way that all looks like it's, um, it's got nothing to do with sort of bilateral uh, relations which come sort of freighted with politics and other bad things. It makes it look very kind of technical, but actually it's giving, it's a mechanism by which um, individual part one countries get to exercise quite a lot of influence over the operations of the World Bank. And I do find this figure of 40% of the operational budget quite astonishing. It should be a source of considerable worry. Um, I want to, so that's the World Bank. I want to say something about UNCTAD. This is an organization I know and love. I've been involved in, in the negotiations around the mandate of UNCTAD. Um, UNCTAD was established in 1964 um, under the UN General Assembly um, as a kind of a think tank for developing countries. It's a tiny organization, and yet it, has, um, it was the source of ideas in the 1970s and the 1980s of a new international economic order. The, um, it kind of mobilized developing countries to put their heads together to rethink how the international economy was organized and how it might be made to work better for developing countries. Um, and although those ideas sort of just died out, or rather they were kind of marginalized and suppressed by the Western countries, nevertheless, UNCTAD's annual trade and development reports have continued right through to today to challenge the reigning neoliberal or Washington consensus. And so, not surprisingly, Western states, led by the US, by, by Britain, by Switzerland, surprisingly enough, have exercised uh, great efforts to kind of either close down UNCTAD or at least to marginalize it. And in particular, in the negotiations in Doha, as it happened in April of 2012, which I was on the margins of, I was present to, to observe them, um, the Western states kept saying to UNCTAD, your job is to monitor the effects of the crisis, the effects of the international financial system and so on, the, just the effects out there in the periphery, in developing countries, the effects on youth, the effects on gender, the effects on poverty, the effects on whatever you like, but your job is not to undertake analysis of the functioning of the international financial system or the international investment system or anything else. That's for us in the West to, to, do, to do and to uh, prescribe for, not your job. Um, and they've had considerable success in marginalizing UNCTAD in these negotiations in Doha last year. The West was adamant that in the next four years, the mandate for the next four years should not contain phrases like, for example, policy space. That phrase was forbidden. Uh, should not contain the words, an enabling state. That phrase was forbidden by the West. And unfortunately, the developing countries were very feeble in pushing back against these uh, Western efforts. It wasn't until really the last two days that the big ones, China, South Africa, Brazil, climbed into the driving seat on the developing country side and managed to get into the mandate for the next four years some kind of wiggle room which would allow UNCTAD to continue to do work as it has been doing in these trade and development reports on the functioning of the international system. Um, and just quickly, UNIDO. Um, UNCTAD is fortunate in that its budget, most of its budget, comes um, from the Secretary General's general budget in New York. Um, and to that extent, it is protected from, to some extent, uh, protected from direct withdrawal of funding by um, the part one, that is the, the Western states. Um, whereas UNIDO uh, depends on direct contributions from its member states. It does not get its budget out of a central UN budget in New York. And the Western states 
have been increasingly withdraw cutting their budget and actually withdrawing from the membership of UNIDO. UNIDO's the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And so the US, the UK, Netherlands, they've withdrawn, they've cut all their funding. They're pressing France to withdraw. France will probably withdraw. You, um, and they've been using the argument, this is uh, an agency dealing with international, um, industrial development. We have plenty of firms, McKinsey and all those other firms, that deal with industrial development. So let the private sector deal with industrial development. We don't need a public agency to do that kind of thing, least of all one under the UN. Um, and so just at this time of acute crisis, a Chinese has recently been appointed to head UNIDO, just as a Brazilian has been appointed to head the WTO, which is also in crisis. Um, another quick word about UNDESA. DESA is the Department of Economic and Social Affairs in New York. Um, and for a long time, DESA was the only part of the whole UN system, together with UNCTAD, which expressed non-neoliberal um, analyses. But recently, um, a Chinese Undersecretary General and a Pakistani Assistant Secretary General have been put in charge of DESA, and they've basically turned it into an intellectual wasteland. What their agenda is, I have no idea, but the basic point is that now only UNCTAD uh, within the whole UN system, that is including the IMF and the World Bank, is, is a source of, um, and actually only part of UNCTAD, because other parts of UNCTAD are just like the OECD. Part of UNCTAD is the only source of non-neoliberal ideas coming out of the whole UN system. Um, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this except to say that um, a whole, if you look across other international organizations, you see that um, the G20 countries have become um, much more present than they were before. Um, even in the OECD, um, the OECD has brought in um, these countries called the BICs, Brazil, India, Indonesia, China, South Africa, not as members, but as key partners. So um, as the OECD tries to mainstream development across all its operations so that it's less of a club of rich industrialized countries. Um, so it is bringing in these countries, these big developing countries, uh, but it can't call them members because they don't meet the membership criteria. So it calls them instead key partners, just like Spain is brought into the G20 under the name of permanent guest. Um, in terms of uh, regional organizations. I've been talking about global intergovernmental organizations. I want to say a bit more about two significant regional organizations. And the first one is um, um, an organization under ASEAN. The ASEAN plus three plus three is China, Japan, South Korea. Uh, it's the, called the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization. It's a god-awful name, but that's what it's called. It was established in 2000 in the wake of the East Asia crisis um, in order to provide a regional alternative to an IMF rescue. The point is that during the East Asian crisis, some countries in East Asia were, had overflowing foreign exchange reserves, China, for example, Japan, for example, and yet there was no mechanism by which they could use their overflowing reserves to help countries like Korea or Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia that were in desperate need of foreign exchange. There was no mechanism. So in the wake of that, they got together and they said, look, let's have a, a currency pooling um, arrangement such that if there's another crisis um, the, within our region, then the country in crisis can draw upon the foreign exchange reserves of a country which has surplus foreign exchange reserves, and that was called the Chiang Mai Initiative. So the whole idea of this was to get more autonomy from the West, the West meaning the IMF. Strangely enough, from the beginning, this Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization built in what was called an IMF link. And what that meant was that for a country, uh, to, let's say, Korea, suppose Korea went into crisis, for Korea to borrow from uh, this Chiang Mai initiative pool of foreign exchange um, 
to borrow more than a very small amount, the country would have to be first under an IMF program, under an IMF standby program. And that would mean that the IMF would be putting all kinds of conditions. The IMF run by the West would be putting all kinds of conditions on, in this case, Korea, as a condition of Korea borrowing from the Chiang Mai Initiative currency pool. And you think, what? The whole point of this was for these countries to escape dependence on the IMF, and they built in an IMF link from the beginning. And the basic reason was, um, uh, was a moral hazard. Uh, the, the worry was that, um, was this, uh, that uh, the Chiang Mai Initiative would have to put conditions on its loans, because otherwise, if Korea or Indonesia knew, if the governments knew, that they could get unconditional loans on very good, very soft terms from the Chiang Mai Initiative, they would have an incentive to be reckless in the way they ran the economy, uh, knowing that there would be this backstop of easy borrowing. Um, so that was the moral hazard problem. Um, so, and therefore, there had to be conditions attached to loans from the Chiang Mai Initiative. The worry was, um, that the distrust between China and Japan, which were the big foreign, uh, foreign exchange surplus countries, the distrust between China and Japan was so great that everybody was worried that if um, a country, say Indonesia, went to the Chiang Mai Initiative, got a loan, then either China or Japan would come under the table, under the radar, and give a loan without conditions in order to buy favor by goodwill from the government in crisis, and this would undercut the conditions of the Chiang Mai Initiative. Um, and so the IMF link was instituted in order to avoid this problem, because it was assumed that the IMF would be able to find out if this kind of thing was going on. And um, so that, that is part of the design. It, it didn't... Um, it didn't uh, create the kind of autonomy that was intended. Um, the, the other thing, though, to say about it is that um, in this current crisis, when, for example, Korea in 2009 really needed an emergency loan, did it go to the Chiang Mai Initiative, which it had been an active architect of? No, it went straight to the Fed. Uh, did Indonesia go to the Chiang Mai Initiative when it needed an emergency loan? No, it went to the Bank of Japan. And so um, I make this point because in Latin America and some other parts of the world, um, the Chiang Mai Initiative in particular is often held up as an example of what we, that is in Latin America, we in Latin America should be doing because there's, it's this wonderful example of regional cooperation. Um, but actually when you look at it in more detail, it doesn't look quite as wonderful, so to speak, as you would think. Let me say something about the BRICS, because this is actually quite interesting, and if any of you are looking for a dissertation topic, then I think that uh, in this general area, then I think the emergence of the BRICS is something that is really worth paying attention to. I am astonished at what I learn is actually happening. If you consider the history, um, the BRICS came into existence in the form of an acronym. That is, Jim O'Neill in Goldman Sachs simply coined the acronym BRICS uh, 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 to bring together countries that had never previously thought they had anything in common. They had very little connection. Um, and yet, having been acronymed into existence, so to speak, they are actually beginning to um, cooperate. Um, it's kind of like... Um, it's as though um, all countries in the world whose name begins with M formed a monetary union. You would think that the chances of a monetary union amongst all countries in the world whose name begins with M are precisely zero. And that's what I thought would happen with the BRICS. Let me just run over the history. It all began with a meeting in 2006. Uh, the foreign ministers note meeting in New York, that's significant. And then uh, there was a BRICS summit, so up from foreign ministers to summit level in 2009. Then in 2010, South Africa was admitted to the BRICS, so instead of it being written with a small s, 
was now written with a big S. Is that um, why they admitted South Africa? To get the big S, <laughs> yes. Um, and then, so, and they've met five times since the first summit, uh, the last time being in March uh, of this year. Um, what have they been doing? Well, first of all, in the organizations that I know and love, namely the World Bank and the IMF, I've been surprised to learn from uh, my conversations that the executive directors of these five BRICS countries, they are actually meeting. They're getting together for lunch or something like that, roughly once a month, once every six weeks, really just to kind of coordinate, see, to lay out their positions, see how much agreement they can get, and so on and so on. They never used to do that, but this is real. But more importantly, in March 20 of this year, the leaders agreed to create a BRICS development bank and also what they call a contingent reserve arrangement. The development bank is mainly to fund infrastructure and at least initially to fund infrastructure amongst themselves, not elsewhere. Um, and the contingent reserve arrangement is a currency swap modeled on the Chiang Mai initiative of multilateralization. They actually seriously hope to sign these two things into existence at the next BRICS summit, which will be next year in Brazil. And again, the rationale of both of these, the explicit rationale, is to bypass their dependence on the West. So let me just highlight a couple of issues that they've encountered as they tried to negotiate these two projects. First of all, in the Development Bank, one of the issues is whether to invite the advanced countries to join as members, and there's a split. India and South Africa say yes, and Brazil and China say no. Brazil's objections um, are based on the experience of what happened when the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, invited Europeans to join and to contribute capital. Because as the Brazilians say, what happened was that the Europeans started to try and run the Inter-American Development Bank. And this generated a lot of conflict within the organization. So the Brazilians and the Chinese don't want the advanced countries in, at least not early on. And the second thing is... Um, this IMF link, um, and this is what a Brazilian, uh, a senior Brazilian involved in this process told me as to why they have the IMF link. Because we cannot impose conditionality on each other, we don't want to be in the role of Germany imposing conditions on Greece, and therefore we must bring in the IMF to monitor the conditions. Um, and then there's a disagreement amongst them on what is the threshold for an IMF link, that is, how much um, should be able to be borrowed from this currency pool uh, before the country is subject to an IMF standby agreement. So let me um, conclude, um, just some quick conclusions. First of all, the West, in terms of this idea of an emerging world economic order, the West still dominates economically by far. It still rules um, with a combination of hard and soft power. So we're not in a post-West, we're not in a de-Americanized world order or, or anything close to it. I've suggested that the idea of multipolarity is exaggerated because very few developing countries beyond China and maybe India have had any significant increase in their economic weight at least using the measure of economic weight that I used. Um, thirdly, all the G7 countries remain in the top 10 economies by share of world GDP, and they remain certainly in the top decile or maybe the top 5% uh, of uh, uh, countries by um, average income. In terms of the idea of the power shift, um, it's certainly the case that now, as compared with, say, 20 years ago, um, a sizable number of non-Western economies have become um, interconnected enough with the rest of the world that certain global problems cannot be managed without their cooperation. And so that's why they must be brought in, they must be present at the top table. That was the rationale of the G20. Um, and so, that, uh, that is why there's been this big increase in inclusion 
in international organizations. Um, that's the first point. Second point is many developing countries, uh, at the, especially those at the top table, have been able to exercise more autonomy, that is to resist what Western states have wanted to say no, to exercise a kind of a veto. But um, they have not been able to take the third step, which is to gain more influence. They haven't undertaken much by way of leadership. Um, we've seen that the West keeps a, a grip on the international organizations, and that's partly because of very strong institutional inertia. And it turns out that the designers of the post-World War II international organizations put in very high hurdles to constitutional change. The obvious case is the UN Security Council with the permanent five veto, but also the case of the World Bank and the IMF and its supermajority, and the, I, uh, the US having been the only state which has uh, the power of veto. One state is able to veto any change. But, also there's, uh, but then if you go down into the details, you learn this surprising fact. In the case of the World Bank, the Articles of Agreement allow any member to veto a loss of voting share. This is called preemptive rights. And what that means is that um, any member that is faced with a loss of voting share of, let's say, from 2.82 to 2.81 can veto that change and, in effect, veto the whole voting system change. And so in these agonizing negotiations from 2008 to 2010, you had Putin, for example, P President, uh, then Prime Minister Putin, ringing up Zelik, and the president of the bank, and haranguing him, saying that if Russia lost so much as 0.01 percentage point of its votes, it would veto the whole thing. And um, the Saudi Arabian counterpart to Putin did the same thing. By the way, the most overrepresented country in the World Bank is Saudi Arabia, and the most underrepresented country relative to its share of world GDP is China. China's given up a great deal because if China did not give up a great deal, then China would get a huge increase in its voting share, and there would be very little for all those other countries. So China has magnanimously agreed to give up a large part of its um, eligible share. Still on this point about power shifts, there's been much less power shift than is generally presumed, and another reason is because the, basically the developing countries have been very ineffective in coming together in power blocks, in particular the G77 plus China, which is the UN gathering of developing countries, is very ineffective, very easily split by Western countries. And I particularly like this little microcosm. Um, I've been at meetings where representatives of the South Center in Geneva declare to the audience that the South Center is the functional equivalent for developing countries of what the OECD is for the rich industrial countries. And so then I've asked them, well, how many people does the South Center employ? It turns out they employ 10 plus one translator. And the OECD employs 2,200 staff. And there could not be a clearer um, illustration of the asymmetry of power. And so in this kind of context, the rise of this very improbable grouping, the BRICS, is potentially quite significant. And it will be very interesting to see whether in 2014 the BRICS managed to launch these two projects that I've talked about namely the Development Bank and the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, and other projects that they're negotiating. The, um, on t in terms of an ideological shift, not much sign of a retreat of neoliberalism, some sign that developing countries have got more autonomy to resist neoliberal principles, but not um, that there are new principles, non-neoliberal principles, um, emerging. In terms of effectiveness, um, if you look across many issue domains, what you see is a pattern of um, gridlock, stalemate, um, fragmentation. Um, one obvious reason being the institutional inertia that I talked about before, such that 
Western states have a built-in uh, power advantage, which is very difficult to change because of these things like the rules of the veto, the rules of the supermajority. Um, but secondly, the obvious reason that as you bring more parties to the table, then collective agreement gets more difficult, but especially when um, the newcomers bring very different preferences uh, to bear. And this is illustrated by the case of China. China is number two in its terms of its share of world income. So China sits in these gatherings sometimes wearing the hat of a superpower, um, equal almost um, to the US, at least in the perception of Chinese. Um, but also, China is number 73 or thereabouts in terms of GDP per head, average income. China is a very poor country, and so China can also sit at the top table wearing the hat of we are a very poor country, we cannot be expected to undertake the responsibilities of a rich country. Um, and so China brings very different preferences to the top table than, for example, when uh, the top table was comprised just of the G7 uh, countries, or the G8. Um, and What, what we are seeing, if you look at, across many issue domains, is a kind of a tangled web of agencies um, uh, uh, operating in overlapping jurisdictions um, with little coordination between them, and each agency having some jurisdiction over some small part of the larger issue. And one clear case in point is derivatives. Derivatives um, trading. Derivatives have been called, as you will know, by Warren Buffett, amongst others, financial weapons of mass destruction. Um, so you would imagine that it would be extremely important to regulate, to have a coherent regulation of derivatives. But the truth is just the opposite. The regulation of derivatives is, is, is extremely fragmented. You have, for example, um, at, at least four organizations, uh, international organizations, trying to exercise jurisdiction over parts of the derivatives market. One is the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Another one is the International Organization of Securities Commissions. Another one is the Committee on Payments and Settlement Systems. And a fourth one, a more recent one, is over-the-counter, um, what is it called? Over-the-counter derivatives regulators forum. Um, so f at least four agencies, overlapping jurisdictions, competing against each other, not coordinated, and each of them dealing with little bits of the overall problem. And yet this, is, uh, it, this, this applies to these very powerful, very destructive uh, forms of um, financial um, instruments. And so the, the bottom line is that... Um, the combination of the West's continuing grip on influence, as distinct from autonomy, and the rest, and the rest, or the South's greater presence, plus greater autonomy, produces this kind of leadership gridlock that we're seeing, and that means that there has not been much increase in the supply of global public goods, such as um, uh, derivatives regulation, or such as in climate change. Uh, relative to the need for this um, increase in supply. Um, what about the future? Um, whenever I come to the question of what about the future, I remember this, uh, this uh, dictum, um, which is sometimes attributed to J.K. Galbraith, but his son Jamie tells me that J.K. Galbraith did not actually say this, but it's worth remembering. Astrology was invented in order to make economic forecasters look good um, and then, again, remember that in the 1980s we had this academic industry predicting the end of U.S. hegemony, as in Ezra Vogel's Japan was number one. Um, we have the evidence assembled by Philip Tetlock on the failure of experts' predictions. Um, so I think I, w I want to end just on a note of um, optimism. Um, because there is a way out of all these conundrums. This is the international uh, economy, all its parts, and this is 
the outcomes that we des want. We want balanced, sustainable um, <coughs> growth. Um, the only trouble is that we need a miracle in the middle in order to get to this outcome. Actually, what I just said... That was Anna, optimism? Yes, this is optimism. Uh, we can surely produce the miracle. But what I just said reminds me of one other thing I wanted to say, and that's kind of a lead-in to the lecture tomorrow. Um, in the uh, run-up to the um, G20 summit in St. Petersburg in September of this year, um, a working group of the G20 proposed to alter the G20 um, central objective, uh, the central objective being, as the G20 has defined it, uh, strong, balanced, sustainable growth. Strong, balanced, sustainable growth. The working group wanted to add strong, balanced, sustainable, inclusive gro uh, growth. And the G20 finance ministers said no, uh, because inclusive, that's, that means social work. That means kind of politics. Uh, that means something technical, we, uh, non-technical. We, we're technicians, we're finance ministers, we don't want to get into politics. So we can't have inclusive growth. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about this issue of um, inequality um, and its costs. Um, and the way that it is, those costs have been ignored. And this is an example of how the question of inequality has just been systematically marginalized. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. I think we have 15 minutes. Is that yeah, right? Five thirty. Just want to remind everyone both the lecture on tomorrow, which will be in the Lake Room in the Social Science Building, but also Thursday from 12, 15-ish till 2, there's an open discussion seminar where all of these issues can be freely discussed back and forth. The agenda is just defined by who comes and what they and, want and to talk about. And that's where you'll tell us the miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, Dr. Wade will be having office hours from 11 to 12 tomorrow morning. So if you want to uh, schedule some office hours one-on-one -on -one time with him, come see me after the talk. And uh, where will that be? In your office. Oh, where's my office? office? The one you were in earlier. Uh, do they just, know just, where? Just come office. see me and we'll be scheduled. 119 Social Science. Anyway, I'd be very happy to talk to you about any of these and any other issues you want to. But uh, are there issues now? Um, sh shall I just? I think you can just yeah. call. Please. Yeah, just two little things. Uh, among the BRICS, you, you mentioned you know, that China and India didn't want the Western powers in. But the, the two British Commonwealth countries did. You know, And I thought that was maybe the connection uh, South Africa and India, that, that they feel that they have a connection to the uh, Eng English, uh, Anglo-American alliance or something, and would be more welcoming. Uh, that's just an observation. And then the other thing I, I wanted your reaction on is, is Turkey. Because uh, I know in some formulations the, the brick uh, had, had a T on the end of it for Turkey. And Turkey was completely left out of the discussion, so I'm wondering uh, what your feelings are about that particular country in, in the scheme of all this. Well, I don't know whether um, there is discussion going on amongst the BRICS about bringing in um, the sort of second tier BRICS, if you will, namely, for example, Turkey, uh, Indonesia, uh, Mexico, might be included. I don't know. What I do know is that um, Turkey will have the presidency of the um, G20 in 2015. Australia is next year. Um, and um, the G20 operates a troika system so that uh, the, the governing troika consists of the current year's president and the previous year's president and the prospective year's president. And therefore, Turkey has just uh, gone into the Troika, because it's going to be president in 2015, and is, um, is clearly going to take its presidency um, of the G20 quite seriously as an opportunity for it to showcase its, uh, and uh, make claims for its leadership uh, capacity in, um, in these kind of uh, forums. But more than that, I'm afraid I don't know.
Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so I'm just a little bit curious about the, the miracle. And um, the, the question that I have for you is, is uh, you make it sound like um, there's very little sort of movement towards um, a more represent representative system uh, for you know man management of global affairs. And, and um, I'm curious, where would the pressure for that, for a, a more inclusive system come from? Um, I mean, is it because this is happening in such a rarefied technocratic sphere that there's, that there, there's little public concern for the way that this is structured? Um, is there any kind of um, movement or organizations within the countries that are controlling the system, like the US and, and the UK, to make it more equitable and, and fair? Uh, so, wh where would the pressure come from to, to reform um, these systems so that they are uh, there's less of a uh, U.S. hegemony or uh, a sort of neoliberal bias? It's a good question. Um, first of all, um, this is not exactly a source of uh, acute pressure, but let me direct your attention to this article in Global Policy. The same journal, though not this particular issue. Um, this uh, article lays out um, a, a way of um, abolishing the G20 and replacing it with a new Global Economic Council on a proper constitutional foundation, that is to say, with a proper representational system based on a reformed version of the IMF and the World Bank's representational system. Um, so um, I'm always inspired by the fact that Keynes and uh, Harry Dexter White uh, set to work to, uh, to debate, to, to design um, a new kind of international economic order um, after the Second World War. They set to work in 1940, uh, way, way, way before there was even any real prospect that the Allies would actually win war. And they knew that it was going to take forever to kind of go backwards and forwards about um, getting a, uh, a design, the de kind of design that did emerge in 1944 at the Bretton Woods negotiations. And I'm, I, when I was working on this article about uh, the new Global Economic Council, I kept that example in mind uh, because absolutely nobody um, that I've encountered who has uh, got anything to do with the G20 process I mean, in, 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 is in a G20 country and is involved in the deliberations of the G20. Absolutely nobody wishes to touch this issue of the membership of the G20. I've tried to bring it up in, um, in the relevant parts of the British government. They don't even want to discuss it. They change the subject immediately. This is just something not to be discussed. End of story. The, the membership, the constitutional basis of the G20. So um, then you have um, occasional statements like that from the Norwegian foreign minister. Um, the G20 is the biggest setback to international relations since the Second World War. The trouble is that uh, neither in Norway nor anywhere else, for example, who knows, Nigeria? Nigeria is permanently excluded. Egypt is permanently excluded. Um, all those Latin American countries except Argentina and Brazil permanently excluded, but nowhere, as far as I've been able to work out, is anybody given, giving any thought to um, how to reform the G20. Everybody's just taking it as given that it exists. Um, they may complain about it, but nobody's giving it any thought. So I just don't see any um, movement. Um, for reform, at least in terms of this, what is meant to be the apex organization, the steering committee, so to speak, of the world economy. I don't see any movement for uh, reform. Uh, all, all the people who are on it just don't want to even talk about it. Um, so, um, yeah, before, before the miracle, I mean, the, the, optimism, the optimistic scenario is that a miracle happens. The pessimistic scenario 
is that uh, at least one more major crisis uh, happens, uh, and not a crisis out there in the, in the periphery or the frontier, however you want to talk about it, like in East Asia. Remember, right now, um, property markets in Thailand, in uh, Malaysia, in Indonesia are going uh, in something like the way they were going in the mid-90s. And it's at least possible that there will be a really big and multi-country uh, uh, crash out in East Asia. But as long as it happens out in East Asia, then that's, it's out there. And, you know, we, don't, we, we can say, as we said in the, uh, after the East Asian crisis, that the crash happened in East Asia or in Russia or in uh, Latin America because of governance failures out there, nothing to do with our system. And um, so that the, the next crisis will have to hit us um, in order to... Um, this, this is kind of... You could, it's pessimistic, but on the other hand, it's also optimistic to think that even with one more crisis, there might be a significant movement for reform, for example, reform of derivatives markets regulation. You can see I'm kind of going round in circles because I'm not actually very optimistic. I, I think that the, the forces, especially in the financial sector, that um, actually like the current arrangements that have not suffered very much from the crash and the long recession they are so powerful in terms of, again, I'll be talking about this tomorrow, um, in terms of things like political party financing, that it's just very difficult to see um, how things can be improved. And it's particularly worrying, I think, in terms of climate change. I mean, I was just reading yesterday on the plane coming over here that in 1985, the um, experts um, who were contemplating how to protect Venice from flooding considered the maximum possible sea rise was 31 centimeters. And now the IPCC uh, models are predicting that the most probable, not the maximum, but the most probable sea rise that Venice will face is 80 centimeters. So it's up from 31 maximum to a probable of um, 80. Um, that's how much... Um, uh, uh, sea, sea, sea level rise is likely, in, at least in the case of Venice. And yet, uh, just remarkably little, I think, is being done, whether in Venice or anywhere else, about this looming problem. And it partly reflects this pattern of gridlock, stalemate, fragmentation in global governance that I've been talking about. That was a long answer. Um, okay. Sorry. I go round and round on it, and I just don't see a kind of magic way out, except a miracle. Yes? In, in terms of a crisis, is it, a repet is it the frequency or the depth of crises that matters for in terms of changing the international order, and how, can, can you extrapolate a little bit on what kind of crises you can see is actively affecting um, the change you would want to see? <sighs> So if you can't well, use a miracle, now give us the crisis yeah. that's going to produce the miracle. <laughs> well, if you, if you go back and think about Bretton Woods, the post-war order, um, think about what, what was necessary to produce that degree of cooperation amongst a relatively small set of states. At that time, only a small set of states counted. And the two main ones were the US and Britain. Um, but it was the series of catastrophes. It was the First World War, it was the Great Depression, it was communism, it was Nazism. It was um, the Second World War, just one after the other coming down. And um, uh, so it, the degree of cooperation um, uh, expressed between that relatively small number of states at Bretton Woods um, was historically unprecedented at that time and also subsequently. And uh, the question is, um, are we going to be smart enough to um, reform uh, world, the world economic order, the governance arrangements, um, short of a series of catastrophes of that kind? Um, and I just leave it as an open question. I, at the moment, I don't see 
what, what is really depressing is that this crisis that really started in 2007, that's now been going on for almost six years, almost six years in, in a real big slump with very high levels of unemployment, especially youth unemployment in this country and Europe, um, but it has led to very little momentum for uh, any kind of significant uh, reform, just little bits and pieces. I mean, for example, this, this, uh, and I'll finish on this point because this is really, I think, dramatic. Um, in terms of this idea of the dominance of neoliberal ideology, you can't get a clearer example of the dominance of neoliberal ideology than Basel II. The Basel II um, set of principles for judging the adequacy of bank capital. The point is this, that uh, uh, this was kind of agreed in, in the 1990s, although it was formally announced in 2004. And the basic point of Basel II was that um, banks were to uh, regulate themselves. It was self-regulation, that is, they were to judge, they were the best judges of how much capital to put against their, um, their loans. And at the same time, these same banks had government guarantees that they wouldn't be allowed to fail. Well, any, anybody, any school child can tell that the combination of government guarantees, the bank will not be allowed to fail, together with self-regulation, you decide how much capital to put, is extremely dangerous. It's like giving dynamite and matches to a child. It was bound to blow up from the time Basel II was instituted, it was bound to blow up, as it did. So this is a very sharp, very clear articulation of neoliberal principles. The market knows best. Well, Basel III, recently promulgated, um, it makes a very small change, and the change in a non-neoliberal direction, but it's very small, the change is that it, um, instead of assuming, as Basel II did, that if each bank individually uh, maintains adequate capital um, in a micro kind of way, just bank by bank by bank, then the whole system will be stable. Basel III recognizes that that's not true, that you need also macro prudential regulation together with micro prudential regulation. So Basel III calls for stronger macro prudential regulation. But um, it's so weak, this, this additional macro prudential regulation is so weak um, and it is so delayed, it's now delayed to 2019 before it comes into force, that Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, who is no fiery-eyed radical, calls Basel III a mouse. A mouse. It's entirely inadequate to deal with the risks of the system. Um, but, um, so that's where we are. That, Basel III is, is held up as big progress in terms of tighter financial regulation, but it is a mouse. And so we are going forward with, in a situation of great danger, and apparently blind to it, but of course um, blind to it deliberately because the financial industry absolutely does not want to have constraints on its activities. It's been able to generate very high profits and uh, sometimes, yes, losses, sometimes fines, but notice that almost no executives, no people have been fined. The banks have been fined, but they've been fined amounts that are tiny relative to the balance sheets of the banks. Uh, until the people, the executives, are liable, made liable for criminal misconduct, then they're going to be, go on behaving in exactly the same way. We now are hearing, just in the last uh, week or two, about a new scandal of rigging of foreign exchange rates to following on from the LIBOR scandal. These people will just go on behaving recklessly as long as they themselves, as distinct from their organizations, are not made uh, criminally liable. No senior banker has gone to jail, except, of course, Bernie Ladoff, what is Madoff, but that was a, really another case. But in this current crash, Jamie Dimon and all those people, none of them have taken hits. Okay, so that is the end of my polemic.